Lucy, thank you again for uh, introducing the podcast. This is Kevin Pruitt with Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is George Weiner. George, thanks for joining us. Hey, Kevin. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be on the pod and was uh, excited when you reached out. We were six seconds into the podcast when you made a whale pun. That's amazing. My <laughs> you, record is three. Rather, I consider <laughs> this a failure. I consider this a failure as the chief whaler of whole whale. It's my Absolutely. job to swim I love through that. the the tides of <laughs> the rising tide of the whale pod so also, i feel like i'm able to do that now like i have i just had my second child uh funny story he was the first baby born of the new decade in san francisco wow did they give you like a lot of gifts and like free car seats or anything Dude, like that or you like you are like everybody who asks this is like oh my gosh did you get the free pampers oh i, I bet <laughs> apple gives out like free stock and free uh free, <laughs> free stock, stock to people like nothing we got a couple photos from a great hospital for free and other than that you know we had a bunch of news cameras charge in about 10 hours after uh, the little fellow was born so um you know kind of cool like no one can take that away from him no he, doubt. you know he had his five minutes of fame he kind of blew it kind of napped through it <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a dad of two. I got a toddler and uh, the little fella. And you know, to take you back, I also run a company called Whole Whale. It's a B Corp. We're a social impact tech company. We work with nonprofits and other B Corps and social impact organizations to increase impact. And, and that's the gist of, of Whole Whale. Uh, my background is a bit of technology, but a self-taught tech. I began at uh, dosomething.org. Dosomething.org is the largest organization for teens and social action in the country and also has, I think, a, a lot of now international footprint. I spent seven years there growing and learning uh, at that organization and became the chief technology officer after starting at a, you know, a junior associate and learned fundamentally that if we were able to leverage the data tech and tools available using at that time, a lot of SMS advertising, SEO, content marketing, a lot of these tactics, we were able to achieve incredible scale. Looking around the nonprofit sector, however, I realized that many were missing the boat. They were kind of sure. throwing away the rest of the whale instead of using the entire thing, hence the name. And I've been at this for about a decade. So I'll pause there because otherwise I'll ramble further. Well, it's interesting because I was listening to a, a chat you were having on another podcast earlier today, and, and you kind of expounded a little bit on the idea behind the, the name of the company. I, I think that would be an interesting, you know, story for the, for the uh, you know, the, just take us to that kind of New England genesis of your, of the idea yeah. here. First off, if you are starting a company and you're in the phase of creating a name, it is so important to have somebody just like that be like, but why have you named this company Whole Whale? Why on earth would this be relevant to a data and tech organization? And it gives me the opportunity to do the following. Uh, so <laughs> well, found number think, two inserted. Uh, what kind of story you are putting toward and behind, uh, I'd say your company name. Like I said, I looked around the industry and said, wait a minute, we are throwing away this great opportunity, this uh, watershed moment of data and tech. If you go back to the way the Inuit 7,000 years ago in the northern regions treated a whale when they landed it, it was a religious taboo to waste any part of that thing. Mm. From the blubber to the bone, they were using it because guess what? It was pretty cold out there. Now, fast forward to the 1850s in the Massachusetts whaling communities of the U.S. They would go out, hunt a whale and bring back literally some lamp oil. And they're like, what a great way to get lamp oil, finally. And maybe some stuff for corsets, but they would waste the entire whale. In times of abundance, we have a natural tendency almost to have that level of waste, to not realize that there is far more use for this thing, this item. That's the mindset that we ultimately bring to any client we work with, any problem we address, we say, guess what? We have the world's largest fulcrum and lever here with the data available, the tech tools available, the broadcasting capabilities at your fingertips. How do we use the entire thing to increase your impact? So the idea, I mean, 
we talked a little bit off camera before I hit the record button about, you know, kind of the times, you know, the reading the tea leaves of, of the, the, the times and the epochs that we're finding ourselves in is this crisis around the coronavirus or COVID-19. So as I'm, as I'm looking about, you know, who your ideal client is and the impact that this could potentially have on it, I would think that your service would be absolutely crucial moving forward. Uh, in this time to really help nonprofits, you know, make it through this, this difficult time. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit about how your service, you know, the timeliness of your service and, and really the, the crisis that, you know, you're facing right now? I made myself, uh, I was playing a little game. I wanted you to say uh, the C word before I did. Uh, yeah, it, this thing is <laughs> you flavoring. Did, you made it. Every, I did. I'm a winner. Um, I set weird games and goals for myself. Welcome to me. <laughs> This thing is a game changer. Uh, for a long time, you know, I think the, the adage of knowing where the puck is going is important. I didn't think it would go this fast, this far. Mm. Ultimately, I knew that uh, understanding digital analytics, digital advertising, traffic sources, and how to wield that tool would be an undeniably important resource, uh, an increasingly important resource. You can look at trends around digital advertising going up you can look at overall traffic. You can look at whatever metric you choose. Eyeballs and attention are going online. And that's where we now deal. It is sad that it's taking this type of catastrophic event to send this many people to our services. You know, if you Google digital fundraising, I'm pretty sure we're around the first actual result explaining yep. what that looks like. And, you know, there's a, just like a twinge of sadness, actually, in my voice, because, you know, it's the best time to plant a redwood was 20 years ago. Someone starting from zero right now has got a lot of legwork to do, mm -hmm. a lot of hay to put in the barn, so to speak, right? There's an entire engine you need to develop. It's not like, hey, I meant to hit the light switch over there. Let me just right. hit that thing. Yeah. There's not a quick way to do this. We're talking about relationships, Kevin, mm -hmm. and it just happens to be online. Yep. the way you measure it, the way you use the tools to get there. But with regard to our business, like I think anybody listening, if you aren't in some way concerned uh, for what's going to be coming in the door or not, right now uh, our clients are, are doing well. Fortunately, we help them do well and it is a value proposition. We produce more value than we cost. That's mm -hmm. the game we play. And more people are still you know, coming through the door saying we need to understand our digital measurements and approach. Um, we also take a heavy training approach and have an entire online course system where we've got DIY courses that people can access at you know a lower cost than having to pay for an agency to do the work. Right, right. So if you had to describe your your ideal client, what, what would be kind of the the ideal avatar? What's the what's the demographics of of who would be a great client as, as an agency client for you? I would say. I would define it more about where they fall in the following spectrum. How reliant are their revenues and impact on a website and digital presence? Mm. On one side, we've got the like corner store selling toilet paper. They're doing just fine right now, right? Groceries, high demand and hiring us would be silly. They just need a Google business page, call it a day, run a couple ads, and you're good to go. That organization doesn't really need us. If you go all the way over to more of the e-commerce land or an organization like Donors Choose or an organization like Crisis Text Line, both of which were clients of ours, if their technology solutions go down, if their website goes down, teachers don't get supplies. People aren't getting responded to in an emergency situation. And so that type of client who is more digitally minded or potentially needs to be more digitally minded is a great fit for us. Is your, is your driving metric, is it, is it funds raised or is it people engaged or, you know, what are some of the key metrics that, I mean, if, if you're, if, you, if I'm a potential client and you and I are in an elevator, we're going up 10 floors, you got a minute, you know, tell me what the kind of the KPIs that I need to be concerned about that you could really help me with. The key performance indicators I'd be looking at, one is first, what is the business, right? If we're talking about your podcast, well, you care actually about attention. 
and defining attention across platforms. You're interested in whether or not somebody has fallen off and listening at this point. And so understanding what drives downloads and what Hi, Mom. is actually <laughs> What drives downloads? So maybe, I don't know, you're taking off in Australia and you're realizing there's resonance there. How do we build up attention to your website and index pages that show up there? What I'm looking for as far as metrics is geographic time on site, mm -hmm. conversions as it relates to actual downloads that I can track, and then looking at how we deepen that relationship, collecting emails and the permission to communicate. So many of our strategies boil down to attaining the permission to communicate, taking a page and many pages, frankly, from Seth Godin and his work. That then leads ultimately to making a sale. And I think if you're tuning out mentally because I'm disproportionately talking about nonprofits, please stay with me. It's a sale. When I sell you on donating to a great cause, a sale has been made. When Absolutely. Sell your candle or sell your ketchup. A sale has been made. Value has been transacted. It is uh, actually very little difference when you get under the hood of the analytics. Let me let me uh, let me drill it down a little bit more in that 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 space you're talking about right now. So you've got. Uh, I mean, let's just take podcasting for instance. So one of the metrics that I mean, probably the number one metric that people talk about is download numbers. We're saying how many people are actually downloading and listening to the podcast. Well. That can be a almost like a false dawn, almost like a, a almost a vanity metric, you know, so to speak. So, is it when you talk to nonprofits, is it numbers of people that you're engaging and are able to communicate with, or is it conversions that is is more important? Um, like, I would almost rather have a thousand really, you know, tuned in listeners that were in a very specific niche than have a million listeners that were just disparate, disconnected, um, you know, kind of this broad hodgepodge of, you know, of listeners. I mean, kind of walk me through that as if, if I'm a client of yours, what are you really drilling down to uh, as the value prop? Yeah, I love the Kevin Kelly, Thousand True Fans. It's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. Some of the things I think his model leaves out is mental decay. <clears throat> as well as just general retention fundamentals. Even though you may have a thousand true fans, it's an error to assume you have 100% retention. For sure. In that world, we look at a marketing funnel that we define as aware, interested, and then converted. There are more layers and more nuance. I'm simplifying because I don't have my like handy chart up here. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm going from aware to interested to converted, I consider metrics at each band and I don't say one is greater than the other. Right. They all have to work in concert. So mm -hmm. at the top of the funnel, what I'm looking for is campfire metrics. Imagine a campfire. You're sitting around. It's warm. It's nice. Someone's talking. I have eye contact. I have your eye contact right now, Kevin, right? Your attention. And this is important. This is the signal I'm looking for in terms of awareness. Mm -hmm. You are listening to my voice. I can tell I have your eye contact and I'm measuring this as a moment of like, all right, that mattered. How do I do more of that and act as that attention merchant building an attention engine? And that's what I'm measuring, seeing how efficiently we can get that to run. Moving to interested. Can I get your email? Can I get you to follow me on a social platform that will allow a one-to-one -one or one-to-many communication to happen? and then measure the CTR, measure the whatever type of engagement that platform allows, and then down to, did I make a sale? You know, can I get a, you know, nine to 90 day to nine month conversion in cycle time of that email based on a nurture campaign to a sale? And some flavor of that will contain nuanced metrics, but that's the approach that we will take more often. I mean, I love that, that kind of the comprehensive nature that uh, maybe a better word is that the integrated nature of the approach that says, you know, there are key, there are important metrics at each level, at each stage of the funnel. And if you are missing the middle part of that funnel, it doesn't matter how well you're doing the kind of the, the opening of the funnel or the, or the closure, you're missing a key piece in that equation that is, you know, that, that is really going from, you know, kind of the attention grabbing to interested to converting. You know, I, I love the way that you framed that. And, and I think that's so important. And I, if I was, if I was a, you know, potential client and you were kind of laying that out for me, that would make perfect sense that says, you know, we're not just interested in 
kind of the outcome here. We're interested in how we get there. You know, it's a reverse engineering that funnel, so to speak. So drill. A I do want to talk about your point about vanity metrics and downloads because it's frustrating. Please. Please do. Because essentially, for those of you listening and you don't understand the plight and the undertone, you're like, oh, it, somebody downloaded it. Somebody listened to it. What happens as a podcaster is the following. You're essentially creating these audio files and you, a video. And, but on the audio side, you then syndicate that into a feed and push that into a bunch of different platforms. The way that ultimately Kevin gets his data back is as though he like mailed off a CD or a compact disc for those of you who are too young to remember to people and has no clue if somebody listened to it. And so there's a sort of discount rate that you have to throw at those downloads. Some ways around that actually are looking at your Apple podcasts. Uh, analytics, which will actually give you in-player analysis, and you can then use that as a quasi-proxy and acknowledgement that, hey, we're making an assumption here of that listening depth because it's yep. on platform that they can tell how far someone went in before they got bored and tuned out. Right. But yeah, downloads are a tricky one because right. also, let's say you accidentally put autoplay on your little player on your website sure. and every review. All asleep at night. And you're like, I did it. <laughs> I have the most popular podcast ever. Yeah, I, I absolutely, yeah, I, I can, I can 100% affirm exactly what you just talked about. And that's why it's, it is more important that the relationship that's built, the networking that, that is built as a result of this than, than the, the sheer numbers. But I, I do want to circle back with you a little bit and kind of walk us through the, the transition. When did, when did Whole Whale start and walk us kind of what it's been since that starting moment to today, kind of the, the walk us through the, the potential roller coaster that you may have been on as, as a founder of a digital agency. I love trying to jump back in the time machine and I will never do it justice. Those of you starting an organization right now are living the dream. It's like terrifying and exhilarating all at once. And that is absolutely the feeling of, you know, I quit my job and now I'm doing a thing. So I bootstrapped this company a decade ago, so in 2010, and went about sort of growing it uh, step by step, client by client, product by product, service by service, and hiring, you know, one, two, three, four, and now, you know, we're around 13 or 14 employees and then some part time on top of that. Uh, so in some senses, I think it has grown a lot slower than if you would ask me 10 years ago, how big would it be? Like, oh, I don't know. 10 years is a long time. I'll probably be like, you know, 50 people. Uh, growing an organization and a company is incredibly hard. Uh, you know, this is someone speaking to you who is like every single bruise and every single freaking mistake. Uh, I've made mistakes in terms of the tax classification of this company. I've made mistakes in terms of uh, budgeting uh, in terms of employee benefits that I accidentally put into a contract. I've made mistakes in terms of state. And now own my house. For, <laughs> it's right. like, yeah, no, I'm like, <laughs> so I think early on it was uh, incredibly exciting because we were working with clients and serving a need focused on analytics, focused on the Google AdWords grant and other tactics that worked over time. What we did was build on successes and productize these services into simple things like digital advertising accelerators or digital fundraising accelerators. Here's the package of things. It was a shift from me thinking that everyone wanted a drill and a two inch drill bit with X number of horsepowers to it, right? Versus no, I just need a stupid two inch hole. What is the two inch hole? I don't need to know the battery. I don't need to do that. I need a two inch hole. So we moved over time into selling that two inch hole. We also layered in products. And I never wanted to be completely reliant on just agency type work, trading hours for dollars. I wanted yeah. something that also scaled disproportionately to input. And so that's just another job. A lot, right? Well, you know, you traded one boss for another. And that's the dirty little secret of a lot of solo entrepreneurs where you're like, yeah, I don't have a boss except for the like five client bosses that I drop everything. Created for one for a thousand, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I think being honest to yourself of like where that is. And that's the big thing of going from zero to one employees. I do believe in treating yourself as an employee, paying yourself first, because if you can't support you, it's unfair to think you can support other people. Oh. Going from one to two was a special moment when I realized that, you know, there's an actual other person whose full-time job is doing it. It was a, a sort of initial like plane lifting off the ground. I was like, I know I can 
support myself. I like, I know enough how to, I could build a website, I could run some ads, I can do analytics. But as soon as I was able to hire one person and train that person how to service a client, that was a special moment. Another fun moment was when we were about like you know, four or five employees and the employees collectively decided that I was too incompetent to manage a client anymore. And they kicked me off of that job. Um, so another thing, if you are growing, is sort of not doing a job so much as working for the company as mm -hmm. on the company. The yep. more you can analyze your time and say, what percent were you working for this thing versus on it mm. will shift over time. And so over 10 years, that has happened more and more where you are trying to put yourself out of work in the job you're doing either by automating it, getting rid of it, or delegating it. Yep. Once you've defined and refined that system, putting that in place. I'm not really talking about our journey as much. It's just 10 years is a long time and a lot of mistakes sure. uh, made along the way, but I can dial in on any phase of growth. Well, I, I mean, I really did kind of the, the way you were framing that, you know, reminded me almost of the whole premise behind the book, The E-Myth. I mean, it is, it is truly, you know, how do you move from working in your company to working on it, you know, and, and to move from, you know, I'm a great baker, but how do I run a bakery? You know, it's the whole idea of, of making that shift. I mean, you were a good digital marketer, but how do you run a digital marketing agency? Those are two completely different skill sets. And, and uh, you had to, you know, it's a rare few of you that can make that transition and do it well. And it, it sounds like to me that, you know, if you, you're up to 13 or 14 employees, you know, 10 years in and, uh, you know, you're bringing in some, some nice revenue, but you're also really delivering for some key clients. And um, I mean, you can look back, you can talk about the failures, but the, uh, the, re the real failure is when you fail to get back up. And, yeah. you know, you kind of learn those lessons along the way. And you probably, I mean, you may actually have benefited, you know, in the long run by making some of those, you know, mistakes over those 10 years that say, boy, I am really glad I, I you know, made that, that error at that time because I could have made it, you know, I, I made it with one employee in their benefits package. But what if I had done that over 50 employees? That would have been a, that, that might have been, a, it might have killed us, you know, that type of thing. So. And I love the way you frame that. So I often think about that, Kevin, like the journey as process mentality. If someone had handed me a million dollars and said, Hey, start this thing in this way, I would have failed so quickly. It would be incredible. It was only through finding product market fit. It was only through working with client after client after client that we refined an approach an internal system and processes that had to grow slowly, not quickly. Mm -hmm. You hear about some of these companies that are like, yeah, I'm hiring like a thousand people right now. Like, how do you think that's going to work out? Yeah. I'm going to get yeah. a thousand new faces in here and that's going to work out just fine, isn't it? Won't change culture, won't cause any system problems. Like if you want to, you know, go far, go slow, go, you know, go with the mindset that this thing, if it's worthwhile, is going to take time. I kind of hate the Silicon Valley, even though I'm in San Francisco mentality of like, oh yeah, like I worked so hard for 10 months and then finally we got our break and I got you know, sold it over to, to Facebook, but it was hard 10 months. I was like, stop listening to that. If you are <laughs> listening to me right now, stop listening to that garbage. That is, um, it's misleading. It's not the way the real world works. It's not the way we work. It's almost the lottery mentality. You know, I, there are, lottery. there are a few people yeah. that there are a lot of people that play the lottery and a few people win it, but it is, it is certainly not a strategy to, to necessarily employ for sure. But I, I mean, I love that the whole idea behind, you know, you're thinking back over the last 10 years and kind of lessons learned and, and uh, you know, just how everything is kind of playing a part in, in, you know, the mosaic of your journey or nothing's wasted, you know, in that economy of the last 10 years. So if you don't mind, I, I would love for you to pivot right here and just really talk about, you know, the one kind of my favorite sub, my favorite part of the, of the interview is really the rising tide. I call it the rising tide startup school. And it's where my guest becomes the professor and you're speaking to those that are listening that are either just getting started or thinking about starting something, but just out of kind of the lessons you've learned over the last 10 years, just what are three or four, two or three really fundamental steps that if you were starting something again tomorrow, how would you drill down and, and just kind of unpack those two or three steps and just say, these are crucial. In my, in my opinion, these are crucial that you really have to 
have to hone in on to, to really increase the likelihood of your success when you're starting something? I would say, I mean, that's, that's a heavy, heavy order. And I've got uh, a lot of, a lot of thoughts on that. You know, my mind, I have to pause though, is like kind of, I'm, I'm a little sad right now. I, I actually had a, had to close our EU, uh, our EU effort. Uh, we had an office for about a year, um, a virtual office out there with a couple of folks I was working with to try to start up a, you know, franchise part of Whole Whale um, in, in Germany. And I mean, they tried so hard. I worked with them like every other week being like, all right, let's try this marketing scheme. Let's our content marketing. Let's do SEO. Here's a relationship. Here's a webinar. I ran, I threw everything I could at this thing. And I was like, I was so sure it was going to work uh, because we were following the play. We were getting traffic and it was just like uh, weight was on us. There was an immutable force that simply said the market is not ready for it. Mm. Germany is just not of the mindset that analytics and tracking and that type of digital marketing is what matters. And there's a lot of underlying social things. And if you are from Germany, if you are internationally, you're like, oh, you try to start there. Thanks. Where were you a year ago? <laughs> That's right. right. But, you know, it's it a Monday of, morning quarterback. <laughs> yeah, I love those folks. Um, they kind of hurt though. You know, I was just, I was frustrated because they tried so hard. I, I, you know, we lost some money on it. Like, that's fine. I give myself an experimental budget every year and we take small bets on things. So here's the first piece. If you're starting, uh, know when to cut bait, mm -hmm. know and set limits for when to cut bait. You know, we have a sort of like, if it goes for a year and doesn't achieve these milestones, don't fall for the sunk cost fallacy of, well, I've already poured $10,000 and six months into this. I got to double down here. I got to push harder. Acknowledge when it's not time to push through and rah, rah, rah. Be realistic. We have so much energy and passion as entrepreneurs. Uh, don't fall in love with the idea. Fall in love with the direction. Oh, I like that. That where you want to end up. And ultimately, keep this in your heart. One is that the idea you have is not unique. It simply is not. You are one of billions of humans. If you have that idea, others do too. The differentiator is in the execution and the ultimate metric you're looking for is product market fit. Is somebody willing to trade a dollar for the thing you do? And does it cost you somewhere close to a dollar or hopefully less to provide that thing? You can do something inefficiently at first for sure, but you need that customer to cite and validate that you deserve to be there. So number two is test it as cheaply as freaking possible. You hear tons of people talking about the MVP and the minimum viable this or that. The, the truth is like it can save you a lot of money. Mistakes mm -hmm. that I've made is tricking myself that I need a more pricey MVP than truly I needed to. I created mm -hmm. this, uh, Another failure, um, one of our products, uh, we created this thing that text messaged you your uh, analytics data from Google and YouTube automatically every week doing a little bit of analysis and a fun sort of like, here's where you are because nobody logs into that stuff. So it was a sort of like alert system that we we're going to build. And guess what? Nobody likes getting data texted to them. But I built the freaking thing. It actually like hooked into the APIs and everything like, yep, there it goes. You know, I, I actually did a podcast on that one. I called it the $13,000 vitamin. So acknowledge when what you created is a vitamin versus a painkiller. I love it. Another sort of lesson being like, all right, the difference here is vitamins are healthy for sure, but we need the thing that when you have a headache, you can't think. You have to stop this podcast, get your Advil, take it, then come back. What is your thing that is going to save that person pain as defined by saving them time or saving them money or making them money? I love it. I, I, I love can, the way I can keep rattling that. on with like things I failed, things I learned. I don't really <laughs> learn them. I'm getting moderately better. I'm actually, I'm doing this right now, Kevin. We're testing a product that I want to build, but I'm not building a single freaking thing. I just put it into a form inside of a webinar sign up. And I'm like, if somebody clicks this, if 20 people click it, I mean, somebody likes it and then we'll try it. It's just pre-production testing. I mean, there it, you know, you, yeah, as far you back as it. it's not even go. MVP. It's like it's like virtual MVP or something that you you created. Right. So future MVP. 
I, I love the way you frame that. And, and uh, I mean, I've, I've asked this question a lot on the podcast, this had the whole idea of kind of the rising tide, um, you know, s- startup school, so to speak. But um, you're the very first one that that's really started this with, you've got to know when to quit. You have to kind of preset that limit that says, if we haven't met these, these measures, that, that it's time to say, maybe this isn't a great idea, you know, and I, and the whole idea of, you know, don't fall in love with the idea, fall in love with the direction, you know, that you were talking about. I, I mean, I love that. And it's not a, I mean, some people would argue that may, well, that's just such a negative attitude to start with. Absolutely not. I mean, it is, it really is not getting enamored with, like you talked about this, the, the sunk cost fallacy that says, well, I've already got this much money into it. So I got to, I've got to stay the Let course. Let it ride. <laughs> Continue. I'll try to double down come on black. Come on black. You know, that's right. Lucy Lou in the fifth. I mean, come on horse. It, my horse is three-legged. It doesn't matter. I'm still going with the horse, but. Uh, His mutter was a mutter. His fodder was a mutter. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, I, I really like that idea that, that you talked about that is, there is a, there has to be a re- realism. There has to be a, pragmatism that is you know that kind of drives this as well that uh, that does have you know you, you need to have a, a likelihood of success you know instead of just continue to chase this dream and, and just kind of you know um, muddle through until it until it works it may never work I mean and, and you really just come to that realization and say what is it and how can I pivot you know what's how can I change the the product itself to to really achieve that product market fit that you kind of outlined. So I, mean, I love the way that you frame that. And I think it's going to be so helpful to our listeners to, you know, to really listen and just really two really key salient points that you kind of outlined there. But as we're wrapping up today, I just, I, I could continue to ask you questions all day long because uh, I just love, love this, the dialogue and just the way you frame things and, and just the content you provided today. But is there something that we haven't touched on that, that you would like to kind of wrap us up with today and then just, you know, let our listeners know when, where's the best place to find you. Certainly, you know, I think coming back to takeaway thoughts, you're doing a great job summarizing my, my rants here is pretty helpful. I should have you on, you know, just follow me around and help people understand what the heck I'm saying. It's great. Thank I need my that. wife for that. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say keeping in your mind that I mean, as you're listening to this and hearing my story of going from zero to whatever, uh, remember that there's no bigger waste of time than comparing yourself to others and other companies. Think about where you are, where you were, where you're going, and in mm. that relevance. If you are listening to this and being like, oh my gosh, I like I wish I was that size. And like, I know that I do the same thing constantly and have to remind myself of like, oh my gosh, I wish I was wait a minute, how old am I? Am I like, like, oh, I'm getting into my late thirties. I haven't done X, Y, and Z. Um, you got to park that. Um, certainly get benchmarks of, of what and why you're doing the work uh, and go that way. A piece I want to touch on, I'd say that I'd love your audience to know about is uh, our university. So these are DIY courses, things around digital marketing, uh, content marketing strategy, the AdWords grant, you could literally start a freelance company right now running the Google ad grant free $10,000 a month for nonprofits, 501c threes worldwide who all need help with this thing. You could charge 500 bucks, thousand bucks a month to manage this grant for organizations. It's a ready-made business to go. And we've got a course that will train you on how to do that. Uh, there's a number of others as well, but that's wholewhale.com slash university. Uh, seems like, you know, a, a lot of folks who, would have to be a certain size to be able to afford the agency, but it, it is something we believe in with regard to training and, and making sure we put out content at every level and also at affordable levels. I, I love the, the way that you, you kind of added those two things together. You know, what do you want to touch on and the, you know, what's the best place to find you online? And we will certainly have that link in, in the show notes as, as we, uh, you know, publish the episode and, George, man, I just really thank you for taking the time today and just, uh, you know, I'm a little disappointed. You, you promised me that there would be a, a small child run through the, the frame at some point in time during the video and I, either I missed it or it just didn't happen. I missed that, that comment that flew by, but uh, just thank you for really just taking the time to share. There we go. Got the, got the family picture on there. Just taking the time today just to kind of share your story in the background and really just kind of feed into 
uh, the journey of those that listen to our podcast and really playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. George, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for what you do, Kevin. You're helping a lot of people find their way out there. Good work.